Plato had a theory that goes like this. All of the qualities that we see that things have in the world around us, whether that's being square or heavy or red or hot or smooth um, and so on, anything, and all the mathematical truths and all the logical truths um, are actually in another realm of reality. That is the perfect or infinite mode of them is in another reality. What we see around us are imperfect copies of those infinite perfections in another realm. So when we see that something's green here, the perfect green in the infinite modes in the other realm, all the logical truths, all the mathematical truths, all the numbers are in that realm of perfections. We have the idea of a perfect triangle, but nothing we draw is a perfect triangle. We can't make such a thing, but the perfect triangles in the other realm. There's, and there is the perfect, and I'm, I'm going to phrase it this way. This is Aristotle's way of putting it. The perfect, what it is to be a tree or what it is to be a horse. There isn't a perfect horse in the other realm, but there's a perfect formula for what it is to be a horse. And all horses in this world are imperfect copies of that definition of perfection. That's what in the other realm. And St. Augustine read that and also noticed then that uh, Plato said that there was a supreme perfection, the perfection of all perfections, and he called it the God and Father of all things. And Augustine says, see, he got it right. Plato arrived at our God. He just thought that all the perfections were individual items in this other realm. He didn't know that all the perfections are in one being God. He missed that because he didn't have revelation. But God is the being with all and only perfections. That's that's the shift. He isn't the first person who has suggested it. Origen suggested that before him. There may have been one or two others, but Augustine really gives impetus to this view. He writes about this stuff in The City of God and De Trinitate, and I have all the quotes there in the text. Um, I consider that the fall of Western theology on a par with the fall of Adam and Eve in, from God's grace in Eden. Uh, the Bible never says, uses the word perfection once about God. It doesn't say anything about there being a realm of perfections. It's easy for us to say, well, there's a heavenly realm and it's got to be better than this one. Maybe it's perfect. But the, the Jewish idea of perfection means complete. See, the only time Jesus used the term was when he said to his disciples, you be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Now, if he meant what Augustine took it to mean, he'd be telling them to be God, which he certainly wouldn't do. What he means is you be completely, completely faithful to your end of the covenant as your heavenly father is to his end of the covenant. Okay, so this is a theory that's dragged in from a pagan thinker to be combined with the New Testament, and now we're to think of the God the New Testament talks about as the being with all the perfections. Now, that doesn't mean all the ones we can think of. There might be an infinite number of them, most of which we'll never think of. Whatever they are, God has and or what's what's just maybe worse, he has only perfections. Now, this view is kicked off by Augustine. It's ensconced by Anselm uh, a, a good while later. Augustine died 430. Anselm lived in the 11 or early 1200s. And then... Uh, Thomas Aquinas is the great commentator 
uh, who adds detail to this, works it out um, to a high degree. Um, and then realizing what this requires, Aquinas has a, a section, a something, a point to make, and he makes in two different works. It means that God has no real relations to you and me. Because that's not a perfection. If the only thing true of God is perfections, he says, creatures have real relations to God, but God has no real relation to creatures, which is impossible. If I have a real relation to God, then God has the property of being related to by me. If he doesn't have that, I don't have a real relation to God. And if he does have it, he has a property that's not a perfection. He says, and Aquinas recognizes that that's what follows from this point of view. That undercuts everything in the gospel. Hmm. And um, I quote him in this new book, and on the next sentence goes, I don't see how any Christian could write those lines and not realize that something had gone horribly wrong with the assumptions that led to them. So I have a lot of respect for Aquinas and his ability. He was a first-class philosopher. He was a theologian. There are lots of things that he writes that are wonderful critiques of non-Christian points of view, defenses of the faith, and clearing up misunderstandings, and all sorts of things. But when it comes to the doctrine of God, not a small detail, he gets it all wrong. Hmm. Got it from Augustine. <coughs> Um, I could go on with this. There are a lot of other things about that. Um, some people, a lot of people are horrified. You mean you're saying God isn't perfect? Well, not in the Platonic sense. He isn't. No. And, and the other, another point about those, that idea that God's all perfections. What, when we say that, what we're doing is uh, selecting out of our own experience all sorts of characteristics of things and imagining there's a perfect degree of them, right? But the characteristics that we're looking at, whether that's to be a triangle, smooth, green, a horse, a tree, a person, we are told are all created. The, the, the perfections in Plato's theory are all self-existent, uncreated, eternal. Mm. And that's why he can say, God just is them, you see. But for Augustine, God doesn't have the perfections. He is them. God's the unity of them all. So what is the contrast then from Luther, Calvin, and then Barth, and from the Orthodox? What's the direct contrast? The contrast is that first, in Colossians chapter 1, we are told, that Christ has created all things visible or invisible, and in his, by his power, they all hang together. Everything visible or invisible is the only place in Scripture that uses what we call a tautology in logic. Everything's either visible or it's not. Even God. If God is, if Christ is created, God is created through Christ, through his divine nature everything visible or invisible, that would include all the qualities like green, blue, square, red, smooth, and everything else that's true of the creation. And one of the uh, great theologians in the Orthodox tradition was St. Basil of Caesarea. And he wrote one time, if there are perfections, God created them. They're not uncreated eternal perfections and God's the unity of them all. What's the unity? What's that mean anyway? If you say God's the unity of them all, it means there's really only one perfection, God. And it means that in God, power, knowledge, justice, mercy, love, are all the same thing. Do you have any concept of love, power, mercy, justice, and so and being the same thing? No, you don't. 
it's it's meaningless so the um, the, ca the, Cappadocian, the Cappadocian fathers of the re Orthodox tradition rejected all that before Augustine wrote it where was the disconnect Hmm? Just, just like an obsession with Plato? Is that the disconnect or what? Well, yes, that and the fact that the Cappadocian fathers wrote in Greek and Augustine says he tried to learn Greek but could never get the hang of it. I don't know that means he couldn't read anything at all or it just meant I'm not going to tackle a long treatise in, on theology that's in Greek. But he stuck with Latin and and he endorsed Plato, whereas the Cappadocian fathers had rejected all of that when Augustine was a boy. Augustine died in 430. The last of the Cappadocians died in 397. And they were Basil of the Bishop of Caesarea, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, his uh, brother-in-law, Gregory Naziansis, and uh, his sister, Macrina, who was the editor for all their works. That says so much, even earlier in that conversation, when I was saying like this disconnect, not being able to either communicate easily or even with the language mm -hmm. creating, and that we're coming into a time where, you know, we can, we can work through a lot of that, you know, uh, listen, you could listen to the Cappadocian fathers. You could probably yeah. find an audio, audio, you know, yeah. Augustine could have listened to them if he couldn't have translate, you know, if they had already been translated. Right. That's right. And so we, you and I have advantages. Those guys would have given anything to have. Yeah. I'm just the implications that we are really in the infancy of. Yeah. An equally sad part about this <clears throat> debacle, as I see it, um, is that at the time of the Reformation, Luther and Calvin rediscovered the Orthodox view. I don't know if they got it from them. I tried to find out. And so far, I've not been able to find out. Um, but they came up with the same thing. And the Orthodox have again and again recognized that, especially about Calvin. One of the great patriarchs of Constantinople was a man named Cyril Lucaris, and he made a trip to Geneva just to honor John Calvin. He knew Calvin had died long before that, but he, he went there anyway uh, to honor Calvin. Hmm. There have been uh, articles in journals since about Calvin and coming up with the orthodox uh, view of God which is that, <clears throat> that God has created everything that we find in the cosmos. So unlike the, the, the uh, Thomist tradition, the, I, I call it the Augustine Anselm Aquinas. So I use the triple A tradition <laughs> in theology, which sees all of the logical mathematical truths as uncreated and eternal. But the, the Cappadocians and the whole uh, tradition uh, in orthodoxy and then in Calvinism was that they're all created. Now, what happened in Protestantism as a whole is that they followed Luther and Calvin on their call for reforms of the church and church practice, but did not follow them at all on something as fundamental as the doctrine of God. And Protestantism has remained as triple A in theology as the Catholic Church has ever been. They're totally at one on that. They, God's the being with all the only perfection. So it's all the so rest. You would say that's even a caricature of Calvin. Um, yeah, a lot of Calvinists, a lot of the Calvinist tradition also rebought into. The, the all and only perfection definition of God, and therefore thought that since the, lo the logic uh, is, consists of eternal uncreated truths, it was okay to use that to prove God's existence. Hmm. So um, they lapsed right back into that. And what was Barth's contribution to trying to... Barth is in that strain of Calvinism, 
that Neo, Neo maintained Calvin, yeah. that position that Calvin had held, maintained that view of God. The very being of God, originating being of God itself, is inconceivable and unknowable. But God has made his himself known in creation. And Luther used his works, his acts, his the, the things he does in creation to make himself known. Calvin calls it manifestations of God. The Orthodox call it his energies. God's energies descend into creation. They have created characteristics. They are subject to the law of, of logic and mathematics and, and so on. That's why we can understand them. And they are God communicating to us. Now, my one of the things that I offer as a piece of original work in this book is at my answer to the question, how can our language apply to God? If our language is all drawn from creation and, and everything in it is created, then how can we be talking about the uncreated creator? And my answer is because the uncreated creator has taken created characteristics into himself. And the model for this is the incarnation. God took the entire created human Jesus Christ into himself so that Jesus becomes the human side of God and God is the divine side of Jesus. But God took created characteristics into himself before the incarnation to make I, himself known to Israel, to Adam and Eve, and to the, 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 the entire Jewish tradition. I've There's, been, I've yeah. been struggling, and I say this, with, I want to say this with respect because I'm not a, I don't like contention. I don't like <laughs> conflict. <laughs> yeah. I, in my experience of, of my journey <clears throat> and experience with my relationship to God, my experience with worship, um, my experience with the doctrines of God or the doctrine of God, uh, is that I guess this platonic idea yields. I mean, it, it's very friendly to Gnosticism. Oh, yeah. And that that I, God is so other, man is so dirty, you know, just like in, in plain sense, you know, it, it's not, it's more nuanced when we obviously are talking about what we're talking about with the scripture, but, yeah. um, and then that I, you know, almost like you don't really participate in relationship, you're kind of like, it's, it's a lot of it. Like a lot of what you do is just constant penance because you're constantly in this struggle to, to become righteous, even though we good Protestants believe in a substitutionary atonement or something That's that, right. but that we, we constantly can't live in participation because there's a gap between that relationship still with this platonic idea. Yeah. And I, it, I feel like I've lived up everything. Eventually it leaks into everything and spoils it. Um, yeah. I, um, I, that's been my experience. Uh, and, and that something like a sacramental, like a sacramental theology of, uh, you know, of course there's sacraments in the Catholic church and everything and all in sure. top parts of Protestantism, but kind of, for me, looking at this, looking at a sacramental life says something about being able to touch and feel God and, and, right. and participate in my faith and receive grace in a way. That's right. That, that is real. That's right. Not, That's right. uh, and yeah. I've been, and that so much of what I've been in has been something along the lines of mental ascent that my faith is more or less a belief in my mind but it's more than that of course and yeah. it's a disposition of from the very heart of human existence the scripture uses the term heart it's a metaphor for the deepest seat of our identity the selfhood of a human and it's that's why jesus says from the heart comes belief, disbelief, blessing, cursing. The issues of life are from the heart, says another 
another scripture. I did a, a study of those terms when I was a senior in seminary. I, the terms heart, soul, and spirit, every occurrence in Hebrew and Greek and looking at the context. And uh, the conclusion I came to is the heart's mostly used for the unity of a person and spirit for the diversity. This person has a spirit of kindness. This person has a spirit of anger. This person is, you see, it's, and then soul is used by Bible writers almost exactly the reverse of the way we use it in ordinary English. We use it to mean what the Bible writers mean by heart, but soul for Bible writers means the embodiment of all of the soul, of the heart and the spirit, the body in which this is, of which uh, the unit, the heart is the unity and the spirit is the diversity, but it's a living body. And in fact, in the, uh, in the Hebrew old Testament, when they sacrifice an animal, um, they did it by uh, cutting an artery. So it was painless as possible. And the Hebrew says the soul part out in the ground. That means it's life. So soul means something that is living. It's not an immortal part of you other than your biotic life. You, it is your biotic life. That's what your soul and spirit are, your, your heart and soul are, uh, and spirit are expressed through. So it's not a body so that, of an evil appendage that you have to think is everything about it's terrible. Um, so that would be the, the, uh, the dualism. Yeah, that's the Gnosticism. That, yep, yep. But you mentioned at the outset, too, uh, that this doctrine of God was somehow connected to the best argument for atheism. If I can just briefly yeah. mention what that is for your viewers, even if yeah. we don't have time to cover it. We're good. Um, the, uh, the idea that God is all perfections means, and you have to think about this, God doesn't have free will. You and I may, but God doesn't. God's compelled to do what he does by whatever is the most perfect thing to do. He can't do anything else. God has no real choices. If, if his nature is supreme, supremely perfect, he can't change because the only way he could change would be to become less than perfect. And he can't, and he has no real choice because his perfect nature compels him to do the most perfect thing, the best thing that could be done. Now, a, a writer caught on to this, a pagan writer, whose pen name was Porphyry. We don't know his real name. Porphyry something he made jewelry out of. And he wrote a book somewhere around the year 250 called Against the Christians. And this is the argument that he gave. If God has all the perfections, then he has perfect justice, right? He knows everything. If, uh, all, and omniscient. He's all, and he's all powerful. Yeah. Omnipresent. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the trouble with that is there's undeserved suffering in the world. Now, if there's undeserved suffering, a perfectly good God would want to stop it. An all-powerful God could. So if there's a God that's all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good, there couldn't be undeserved suffering in the world. So there's no such being as God, because there is undeserved suffering. And if you try to make arguments that all humans are partly evil and maybe they all deserve what they get, I mean, that's not our experience, is it? Our experience is that sometimes the worst offenders prosper and live the high on the hog and the, the, the most pious souls are, are poor and oppressed. But even aside from God, that, animals suffer. And they couldn't have done anything morally wrong. They're not moral beings. So the fawn that gets its hoof caught in a log and burns alive in a forest fire could have been prevented by God, but it wasn't. So there is undeserved suffering. Now, of course, in the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, that's said to be only illusion. There is, there is no undeserved suffering because hmm. there's no real suffering, if you can believe that one. 
I mean, I think we've all suffered enough that we don't believe that. But anyway, um, that's the argument. That's the best argument against belief in God. And it comes directly out of viewing God as the being with all and only perfections. If that's not God, if God has created the world as we find it, if God has created a world in which nature is red in tooth and claw, to quote Tennyson, and the Psalms affirm that, don't they? The young lions do roar and have their food from the Lord. That's what he, that's what he made. You don't like that because you could be the food, but that's the way God made the world. He didn't make it according as close to platonic perfections. I, and I have an argument as to why there are no such things in the book. Anyway, uh, this is why that turns out to be the best argument against God, against belief in God, and why also it doesn't work if you throw that throw out that perfections doctrine and you go by scripture instead. And scripture doesn't describe God that way. An all perfect being couldn't order Abraham to murder his son. Try it. I mean, it's no answer to say, oh, he didn't let him go through with it. No, no. If you're perfectly, if you're perfectly perfect, you can't order it. In Second Thessalonians, there's a comment that in the last days, the people who are opposing the church and the gospel, God will send a strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. You and I would call that dishonesty. If I fool somebody so that they deliberately believe something that's false, I'm a deceiver. That's what Second Thessalonians says is true of God. He's going to do that because he isn't bound by those laws. He created them to bind creatures and creation. And he's bound by the ones he has promised to be bound by. In other words, we can hold God accountable for anything he promised in the covenants he's made us. We do not have the right to hold God to any standard that he didn't promise to abide by himself. And so the new atheists type argument uh, is is holding God to Plato. Yeah, they're well, you can't blame them. I mean, that's been the prevailing view in the Western church of what of who God is. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And just, I find that the discussions today in religious studies, in philosophy of religion, just virtually completely ignore the orthodox view. And they think that the strain of Calvinism that preserved Calvin's own doctrine, which was the same as the orthodox, is just some weird bunch of, they're a bunch of weirdos because they they think God created logic and math. And that means that they're, um, and they think that means that God can make five-sided triangles or make two and two, seven and a half, and so on. And I, t I take up those arguments in the, in the book too. So yeah. to help me, to help me clarify, what is the other, uh, the other argument for the doctrine of God from the Orthodox and. The, it, God has um, eternally taken on characteristics that he promises he will never relinquish. And he describes himself in those terms in his manifestations by his prophets and by incarnating himself in Jesus Christ. He makes that known. That's not a mask over what he really is. That is what he really is because he has, there is no, no, nothing else call, that you could call a nature that God has that that's his nature. Calvin refers to it in the, in, the, in the Institutes as the nature in which God is pleased to manifest himself. It's his choice. And he chose to be kind and forgiving and create an atonement for humans and rescue them from their condition of sin and ignorance and evil. Not to condemn them. That's why John says he didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that the whole world may be saved through him. And is that part of theosis? No. Um, theosis is part of that. 
<laughs> theosis is uh, is the process of what uh, a lot of Protestants call sanctification, it be becoming more Christ-like in our life. And Peter refers to it as sharing the nature of Christ. That is, as Christ was a perfect human being with loving God with all his heart, soul, and mind, and his neighbor as himself, we strive in this life to become more like that, more and more like that, if we can. We try our best. And that will be given to us as a gift. We shall be in glory like him, for we shall see him as he is. Yeah. So problem number two is uh, something like hell and judgment for uh, the Christian. Yeah, you mean the corrections I offered? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Humbling block for many seeking the Christian God. Yeah. Is the divine human destiny versus the annihilation, the annihilation of man. Okay. Uh, yeah. 